birthday fun. This is what every song feels like to me this morning. <laughs> Oh, goodness. <laughs> so what's, what's, the note? what's the difference between Jesus and I believe there? There's a different note, right? I believe. Or is that not true? Um, let's After see. you're my portion. You're my portion. I believe you're more than enough for me. The me there. Jesus, you're all I need. You're more than Jesus, you're all I need. Sorry, I didn't. Sorry. I'm, I'm talking. The other song? Nope, that song. I just always feel like that note is wrong. Not not what we're singing. It's being played. Oh, I'm the sorry. The F there on Jesus? Um, oh. Like, I feel like it's a different note, but it might not be, or maybe it's just the version I listen to, but... Rid of that. The C is what's wrong. Right. The, yeah, there's I'll do it really right. quick after we do the next song. Okay. I'll fix this one. Well, that's that. That might be it. Because it's the, sometimes the C Can gets played because we just song. see it. A request? Uh, yeah. We're not taking requests today. Um, can we sing the T in great? No. And the D no. in God? No. <laughs> We're singing care. it like Chris Tana. How great like is our God? God. Paula, the blue bag up here in the corner is the cleaner. So you want me to do like the splendor of no, the No, it's really just the two words. Actually, Definitely. if you say it like that, that'd be perfect. Really just the tea. <laughs> Loud. How great <laughs> is our God. Bad, Sing with me. How great <laughs> is our God. Sure All will see too. how great, how great is our God. <laughs> every time or just not a few? Not every time. <laughs> oh, every time. Okay. Sorry. I love it. The splendor <laughs> of the king. That's called right out of the gate. Joyce. The splendor of the king. Clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice. All the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light. In darkness tries to hide It trembles at his voice It trembles at his voice How great is our God Sing with me how great is our God And all will see how great How great
Good morning. Welcome to Parma Christian Fellowship Church. Our invitation to worship this morning comes from Psalm 145. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is faithful to all his promises and loving toward all he has made. Let's join together in worship this morning.
Fill this sanctuary with your love. We welcome you here. We want you here. 
we need you here.
to you this morning, all in different places. But when we get to the middle of the ocean and we can't even fathom where we are, can't even fathom how deep we are, can't even imagine how we got there. We can remember that you walked on these waters. You've been through the depth of the waters. You're there right beside us. You've always been there. You are there and you always will be there. We take our trust in you that you will be there for us. We thank you for being our God. In your name, amen. Good morning. Our Old Testament reading this morning is going to come from Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know what they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. A dream comes when there are many cares, and many words mark the speech of a fool. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin, and do not protest to the temple messenger, my vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. Therefore, fear God. Our New Testament reading this morning is going to come from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 29 through 32. Ephesians 4. 29 through 32. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. May God bless the reading of his word today. We used that same scripture about two weeks ago on the family communication aspect of truth. We looked at the first part of that section. We're looking at the second part of it today. If you have your Bible, keep it open to Ephesians chapter 4. Family communication, of course, uh, begins with how we honor one another, the value we place in one another. On Mother's Day, we looked at honor your father and mother, which was a command to a generation who had suffered greatly based on the decisions of their mothers and fathers. Their decisions were wrong. They lacked faith. They struggled. They wanted to return back to Egypt. They were always confused about the nature of God and the situation they found themselves in. And their choices caused the next generation incredible pain, tremendous loss. And God still said, honor your father and mother. Second part we looked at was on bonding, the way in which we connect together and build ties. From infancy all the way up, we're building bonds and creating those kinds of connections that occur. Not just merely the words we say, the way in which we uh, find our lives glued together. We looked at truth. And the ability to be trustworthy and trust uh, creates credibility. Today we're looking at what you say and how you say. It's also communion week, so we keep things a little bit shorter and our prayer time is really focused on the table rather than on our requests. 
one of the interesting pieces of advice that Solomon gives in the book of Ecclesiastes. When you come into the sanctuary, let your words be few. Not a long list of all the things we feel we need God to get right to, but to hear his agenda and to say, yes, God, what would you like to say today? Family communication is based on what we say, but also how we say it. Lagos sapros. I'm not sure you're actually going to pick up that phrase and use it sometime in the next 24 hours, but lagos sapros is a Greek expression that Paul uses in this partic particular section. Words to avoid. When my children were small, we were on a plan to try and help them incorporate Scripture into the way they think. And Matthew, when he was about four years old, was working at memorizing Ephesians 4.29. Do not let any unwholesome words come out of your mouth. He memorized it as, don't let any words come out of your mouth. Well, how am I supposed to talk? No, 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 it's not let no words come out of your mouth. That's what he meant. Then he went around the house, everywhere. Don't let any words come out of your mouth. Okay, you can say something. We got most of the principle of Scripture, but it wasn't quite exactly there. I remember when I was a kid, about eight or nine years old, old enough to start playing outdoors by myself without being in direct view of my parents, and me and several of my friends were playing some late summer, early fall game out in the field, and nearby there was an apple tree in a neighbor's yard. It had beautiful looking apples on it, no one had taken any of them, they weren't harvested, they were just hanging there waiting for young boys to sneak up and steal them. And of course we obliged to that requirement. After we had been playing outside, we went along, we checked carefully to make sure nobody was watching, we snuck up by the tree, kept ourselves low to the ground, snatched two or three apples, felt like we were getting away with really something incredibly valuable, ran off into our play field with our prize, our booty, our treasure. I remember distinctly the feeling of biting into one of those apples, which had a good tight skin and a little bit of clean white flesh, and the apples were rotted from the core outward. There was some disease in that tree that caused its apples to rot. It was mold, it was black, brown, all the fruit was deteriorated, it was wormy, it was disgusting. Every one of our apples was rotted from the inside out. I remember the feeling of having all that rotten stuff in my mouth, the retching feeling, spitting, throwing the apples. You'd think that would be enough to convince us never to steal again, but we figured out a way of being boys. But that feeling of that rotten fruit, that utterly disgusting stuff in my mouth, is the concept that Paul picks up here in Ephesians. It was karpos, sapros. That's the normal expression in Greek. Fruit is karpos. Sapros means rotten, filthy, deteriorated, disgusting. It's an amazing concept. And what Paul does is he takes the concept from fruit and trees everywhere else it is used to describe fruit. And says, don't let words that are rotten, deteriorate, disgusting, come out of your mouth. See, the rot occurred from inside the apple outward. Ordinarily, if an apple gets bruised or there's an insect that burrows in, the rot will come from the outside in. But on that day, it was from the inside out. And that's the concept Paul was saying. In Ephesians 4.29, his statement literally is every lagasapras, every word that is rotten from the inside out, do not let it come out of your mouth. It's an advisory command. It's very interesting the way he says it. It builds on what Jesus said over and over and over to those who are not only his followers, but even his adversaries about the words that come out of our mouth. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 33 through 37, an interesting passage, Jesus apparently is looking at a tree that may very well have been like the one that I encountered when I was 9 or 10 or 11 years old. 
that had fruit that was rotting even while it was on the tree. And he used that as a metaphor, as an illustration, a teaching window. When they may have reached up and grabbed some of that fruit 2,000 years ago, bit into the fruit and found the rot was not apparent from the outside. It was on the inside coming out. And Jesus says, teachable moment. Why is the fruit rotten? Because the tree is rotten. There's something wrong in the essence of this tree. Other trees will produce good fruit. And a good tree will always produce good fruit, but a bad tree is going to produce bad fruit. And that becomes evidence of the way in which we speak. You see, the, in that day, there was a tremendous effort to dance around the law, to make it say things that allowed us to live the way we wanted to live while we were appearing to give obedience to the Word of God. And Jesus swept through all of that and said, no, you cannot play games with the Word of God. You can't. It's not the way it works. God knows it. He wants you to know. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 33 through 37, in the version called the message, is a very interesting way he kind of throws the words into the modern American lingo. Street talk, the way we would normally just say things in order to communicate the truth of the word. In the message it says, if you grow a healthy tree, you pick healthy fruit. If you grow a diseased tree, you'll pick worm-eaten fruit. The fruit tells you about the tree. You have minds like a snake pit. How do you suppose what you say is worth anything when you are so foul-minded? It is your heart, not the dictionary, that gives meaning to your words. A good person produces good deeds and words season after season. An evil pe person is a blight on the orchard. Let me tell you something. Every one of those careless words is going to come back to haunt you. There will be a time of reckoning. Words are powerful. Take them seriously. Words can be your salvation. Words can also be your damnation. See, the issue is not just merely the word choice. When I was a little kid... I rode city bus to go to school, not a yellow public school bus, but I rode the regular city transit system. Put a little token in, five cents, took me to school. Some days I'd ride my bicycle or walk, it was three miles away, but most of the time I rode, rode public bus. And there's something very interesting that happens to a little kid when they ride public transport or school bus. You learn bus language. There's something about older children that absolutely love teaching younger children all the bad words. Not what they mean or how to use them, but how to swear. Back in the 50s, when I was a little kid, the common way of a parent treating a child, which my mother did numerous times, was to get her lavender dove lady soap, lather up a washcloth, and wash my mouth out with soap. I had a friend who had to actually take a bite off the bar of soap and eat it. Ugh. To clean our mouths from filthy words. It gave me the idea that the main point is don't use bad words, the four-letter words like snow. We're done with that for the year, I think. It's June 1st. All the bad words. I was working on a project with a guy this last week who's from the building trades, and we were engaged in a particular process. And as we worked, about every fourth or fifth word was one of those wash your mouth out with soap words. It was just his normal language. It didn't mean anything. He used it as adjectives, adverbs, verbs. Things didn't really make any sense whatsoever, and I really didn't have the... the uh, inspiration within me to say, okay, can you tell me exactly what that word means in that context? Because it was meaningless. It's just like saying um or er or uh. And what's interesting in our culture is we've created a sense that using a four-letter word is somehow about the worst thing you can do with your mouth. And Jesus is not getting to that point, nor is Paul. The Lagos Sapras he's talking about, the rotten words, are not just four-letter words that we use as adjectives or adverbs because we can't think of another word to say. I mean, 
Improve your vocabulary. Read the dictionary for fun. There's lots of words that will fill in those space. I have a comic strip on my, on my refrigerator from Pickles where Pearl comes up to Earl while he's, or uh, Opal comes up to, to Earl while he's sitting in his easy chair and says, where's the thingy I was holding before? And he says, what thingy? She goes, you know the thingy that I had before as it goes through the panel. The thingy? Yes, I'm looking for the thingy. Do you know where it is? He goes, I have no idea what you're talking about. And underneath his chair is a yellow highlighter. She reaches down, pick it up, and says, Aha, thank you very much. That's what I was looking for. He goes, whatever. Thingy is one of those words. It's mindless, empty. It doesn't mean anything. It's equal to me to a four-letter word. Say something. Use a noun. Use a verb. Use something creative. But that's just meaningless talk. That's not what Paul is talking about. It's a very interesting concept that has to do with family communications, what you say and how you say it. I encourage you to do an OOM um assessment. An OOM um assessment is kind of like doing a balancing of your checkbook. Where did the money go? How did you spend it? What did you get for it? An oom assessment means out of my mouth. You can analyze, of course, what everyone else says, but that's not the point. When Paul is writing to those who are followers of Jesus, when Jesus is speaking to those who are both his friends and his adversaries, he says, assess what comes from your mouth. Look at what you say. In the words of the message, take words seriously. They matter. When God created all that is, he spoke. It wasn't that he manipulated. He didn't get stuff and work with it. He said something. And his words brought about reality. His words were creative. We are created in his image. And our words have power. They have immense creative or destructive ability. What comes out of my mouth is evidence of what is planted in my heart. Now, it can be just simply convention. You can chalk it up to the fact that you're in an environment that uses that particular kind of language, that it doesn't really mean anything, but eventually it creeps into your heart as to your view of the world and your place in that world, how you communicate yourself. An oom assessment out of my mouth will be looking at the number of comments that you make that are positive or properly timed. When Paul is writing to the Ephesians, he says, gauge the words coming from your mouth on the basis of the impact they have on your hearers. If you're in an empty room and you smash your hand with a hammer, what comes out of your mouth is simply pain. But when you're in a conversation, with family and children that are very young or parents who are older or siblings that are at a distance or on topics that are either mundane or incredibly important. The impact of your words is how you do your assessment. What does it mean to those who hear you? Does it put them in their place? Does it exercise control? Does it get them down where you feel they need to be? Does it lift them up? Are they in a better place? because of your communication, or are they damaged? Or does it have no meaning whatsoever? It's irrelevant. Now, a great deal of conversation that we have is just simply the stuff of life. Statements and comments and communications of no big deal. But family communication becomes those ways in which we impart our very life. We communicate who we are, who we want to be, how we see others within our family, how the structures and bonds and connections, the values that we communicate work, how they live, how they find vibrancy. So it either leaves them better off or more damaged in a difficult place. The UM assessment becomes a matter of not only what you say and the words you chose to say it, but how you say it when you say it, and probably more important than anything, why. 
We won't be able to take a great deal of time to investigate all this. We may come back to this in another series later on about the power of words and its creative ability. But Paul says, when, when a word comes out of your mouth that is rotten, sapros, it's an expression of your heart. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we just want to thank you for this beautiful day and your message to us today. And we just really want to try to understand it and take it and apply it to our own lives. Please help us to not speak those bad words because those words really are just pointless and ultimately destructive. They're not going to help in our communication with our family, and they're not going to help communicate who you are to the rest of the world. We just ask that you help our words be few and let them be the good words as well. We ask that you just really come into our hearts today and change us from within. Help us speak those great words that make you beautiful. In your name we pray, amen. Will you join us in worshiping? Just sit and wait for all your goodness. Hope to feel your presence. I could just stay. I could just stay right where I am and hope to feel you. Hope to feel something again.
thousand times I have failed, still your mercy remains. And should I stumble again, I'm caught in your grace. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all fame. In my heart and my soul, Lord, I give you control. Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out. My pillow all else, my purpose remains, out of losing myself in bringing you praise everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all fame. In my heart and my soul, Lord, I give you control. Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my
first week of the month is always communion for us. That doesn't make it a ritual. It's not just a sacrament. It's a table to which you have been invited. It is the Lord's table, not the church's table. So we don't set up boundaries around it and rules and expectations and have lots of training. It's a discovery place. If you were invited to somebody's house for dinner, I suppose you probably could check out all the requirements and rules and exactly what to wear and how to sit. But the best thing is, just go. You'll learn. You were invited for a reason, and you are invited to this table for a reason as well. One of the songs we sang was inviting the Lord to consume us from the inside out. Communion is interesting because we take a piece of bread and a small glass of uh, juice based on the Last Supper of Jesus, which was a Passover meal, which they consumed. And we consume these elements. But what's fascinating is when you let Jesus into your life, he will consume you. He changes you from the inside out. It is not merely come and participate in a sacrament. Do your duty. Like everyone else, do communion. It is allow Jesus to come into your life. Invite him in. Allow him access to the place where words start in your life, in your heart. Our song for communion today is Healer. And this can certainly be just merely an event and you walk away unchanged. But if there are wounds that you really would like God to touch. If there are deep places out of which rotten things come and you can't stop that, let him come in. Let him be your healer. We'll sing together and pray and our table will be open for you. Come and be consumed at the table.
Father, the, the table you've invited us to is the table of Jesus. It's not a table of bread and juice. He said, this is my body and this is my blood. Take and eat, take and drink. Do this in remembrance of me. Every time you do it, I'm there. It could be at communion at church. It could be every time we have a, a roll and a, and a beverage. Every time we eat, every time we consume anything, to consume you, to let you in, to let you into the core of our life, to the very center, so that what flows from us starts with you. We need you to be our healer, our restorer. We cannot do it on our own. So we come to this table humbly, but with great anticipation. You know what you're doing, and you invited us anyway. So we come by faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The table is open for you. Come and commune. Would you join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. This morning's promise comes from Proverbs 23, verses 17 and 18. Do not let your heart envy sinners, but always be zealous for the fear of the Lord. There is surely a future hope for you, and your hope will not be cut off. Please join us for the last song in our worship package.
the splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice, he wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. It trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Beginning and the end, God in three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. read our benediction together from Psalm 33. We wait in hope for the Lord. You are our help and our shield. In you our hearts rejoice, for we trust in your holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Amen. And may God bless you this week.